started with the fact that my family background is Czech, which is sort of an odd introduction to being interested in Slovakia. Because if anything, Czechs were never sufficiently interested in Slovakia. Um, but I became interested in, in this as a result of 1968, and that's and my dissertation and first book was about the Czechoslovak relationship from 1918. It was published in 1988, and I was very grateful that in that book I said, you know, the next time there's an opening, there's going to be another discussion about this issue. I have the book. Oh, you do? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I haven't read it. I, I, I read some of it before this talk, and I said, oh, I once, I once read the books that are in my footnotes. It's been, it's been a while. But I'm, 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 uh, what I hope I, I can do today are you know, three things. First of all, I want to set some context for why 68 turned out to matter for Slovaks, um, and t then talk about, about 68 itself. But really, I think the most important thing about 68 given how many hopes were dashed, is what legacies it had, what consequences it had. Some were very concrete and institutional, and some were attitudinal. And so so let, you know, let me just start. I, I passed around what would have been up on the screen if we had a screen. And on the, on the, the top of the, of the second page, um, you will recognize the cavalcade of documents that, that I have listed there. And the, and the point I want to make is one that very strikingly was discussed extensively in all the forum, in all the public forums, but really even before 1968 in in Kultur in in the cultural um, uh, the, the cultural weekly in the in the 1960s, and that is that what all four of these events turned out to have in common, the three that preceded 1968 and the federalism that was part of 1968, is that they all four represented a commitment at least to some kind of asymmetrical autonomy. Um, they all they all occurred in, at critical junctures in Slovak modern history, um, whether it was a crisis or not, but, but at a critical juncture. And the, and the commitments that were made to some form of autonomy disappeared very rapidly in each case. Okay. Um, leaving behind it something that um, became really clear to me as I, as I began to, to to get to 68 in my historical work, I said, I've heard these arguments before. I've heard <coughs> the claims about, about um, what kind of identity should be, what kind of, uh, of security should be accorded to a national identity within the state. And I, I heard the, seeing the commitments made and I seen them disappear. And afterwards, um, certainly after getting as far as the post-World War II Pashitsa Accords, I began to see that every time the Czechs would say, um, look, you're never satisfied, and every time there's problems, all you can do is ask for autonomy. All you can do is ask. And, and the Slovaks say, you know, we need to have a basis of coexistence, and every time we are promised one, it disappears. And I was not surprised to see early in 1968, when, when the, uh, when the uh, censorship was abolished, uh, that this was one of the first things that happened, and then you started getting commentary uh, that was very much like mine. Haven't we said this all before? Huh? And and yeah, it's funny, but it's not funny, right? I mean, it it did. It, you know, to me, those earlier commitments and the very different ways Czechs and Slovaks thought about them and what they meant um, were were something that 
yes, you, we're going to have to have this conversation we, again because we haven't ever resolved it before. And, um, so I think one of the important contexts for what happened in 19, um, 1968 is in part that long history of making deals that ended up um, that, that ended up not resolving anything and creating a, a certain amount of distrust. On the other hand, this is, this is something, uh, about 10 years ago I was at a conference at Tufts, and at that point we were looking at the Velvet Divorce. And we were looking at, and because Tufts was interested in conflict res resolution, and so they wanted to know, well, how do the Czechs and Slovaks do it when everybody else seems to be killing each other when there's a divorce? And, 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 you know, the, and at the end of the two days that they devoted to Czechoslovakia and its demise, they said, well, you know, I don't think that we can draw any lessons from this. This is a complete, an almost unique situation. Because the Czechs and Slovaks didn't hate each other. In fact, in all the polls you can see in 68 and in, in 89 later, who are the people you feel closest to? It's each other. Um, that, that is not what happens in, 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 you know, in, in the kinds of conflict, in Yugoslavia, for example, or in the Third World. So, so at, at the same time the, that uh, you can see that there is considerable distrust and that you can see the reasons for it, and you can see um, what becomes very soon an old recitation of, 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 um, you know, yeah, of concerns, and here we go again. Um, this is a rather different kind of, of discussion than the kinds of ethnic conflict that I teach in classrooms every day. I even find this rather cheering to know that it's possible to eventually get to Yes, on a deal. Um, the second, anyway, so that, that was the, you know, that was the, the, is, I think, the first very important context of, of 68. I think that, um, that there was no way that open discussion could fail to bring this question to the fore again. Um, and the other contextual question in, in, in situation is that of the 60s itself. Um, because there's also no question that um, for a number of reasons, um, you know, that that affected the whole state as well as Slovakia in particular, um, there was in the 60s a, a beginning of a convergence of concerns that were going to come to a head in 68. Um, the, you know, the you know the, the first broader one is that the economy was flatlining, that the economic model, which which produced big growth spurts and eventually stagnation in the Soviet Union, but, but with a country that was already fairly well developed industrially, um, <coughs> um, this Soviet model was going to be even less useful. And, and that was fairly clear. And you started to, you started to hear in 68, the same thing you heard again in 89, we used to be one of the top you know, industrial countries in the world, you know, between the wars before, and now what has happened to us? And that discussion begins with the, you know, with with the failure of the economic model to function. Um, but added to that, um, Czechoslovakia did have very nasty purge trials that were still being sorted out in terms of the post-Stalinist expectation that some of these people deserve rehabilitation. And some were rehabilitated faster and more thoroughly than others. Okay. Um, so it, for the Slovaks, the, the need to, to restart that process, um, there's an irony in this, but the need to restart that process because the Slovak bourgeois nationalists had not been rehabilitated in the way that some of the Czechs had. Um, and certainly we wanted Husak to be. I mean, no, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a serious concern that, that, the, that the, 
that the Communist Party of of Slovakia has pursued and de and developed two more the Barnaby Commission that that investigated these you know the these uh, convictions rather thoroughly and then the you know and, and then one more step of rehabilitation that that restored the series of people um, both those that were executed and those that had survived in, in limbo. So that was the second message that, that you know, that the case of the Slovak position in the society was going to need some rethinking. Um, and then, and I can't explain this, I don't know why it was exactly that Slovak publications began to open up earlier, the cultural publications earlier, and, and I'd love to know if any of you know the answer to that. Earlier and more consistently, um, in the lead up to, the, to 1968, um, then did some of the Czech literary and cultural periodicals. And, and you know, so, so, you know, many Czech writers at the time would say uh, that this is where I hoped I could publish, because this is where um, this is where I'm likely to be able to say the things that they won't let me say in Prague. Um, so those are, I think, the important contextual elements for, for me when I think about 68. But the important political element is undoubtedly the fact that um, all of these strands of concern were able to come together in a leadership change. And although we talk about a totalitarian model, totalitarian models work by political coalition building just the same as any system. And in order for a change to occur, there has to be a political coalition. Okay. And the way we always tended to think about communist states is that you thought about a left-right dimension, you might say, although it was inverted, that you thought about it politically as those who were ideological hardline, moderate, or reformist. Um, but what's important about Czechoslovakia is that that single dimension was not the only dimension. It was a multi-dimensional system, and the other key dimension was identity. Um, and I don't quite see how, if there wasn't the identity dimension, if there wasn't the Slovak discontent with what had happened to them, um, what had happened to the constitutional bargain after World War II, what had happened under the Constitution of 1960, which took even that constitutional order and shrunk the powers of the, you know, of the, of the regional government, um, and uh, you know, for, and at this point, Bratislava was merely a regional district capital. I mean, Slovakia had no capital. Um, if it weren't for that identity d dimension, I'm, I'm not sure how the coalition that disrupted Novotny would have, you know, would have toppled. Um, it wasn't that the Soviet Union was pressing for it. The key in the Soviet case was that they seemed to have backed off. And there was, as you probably know, a long discussion in years after. Did Brezhnev really say it's your business? It's a wash of the devil. And he seems to have said essentially that, whether in those words. Um, so so uh, the and coalition would have to be internal. And, and, the, you know, and the pushing out of nobody was, was I think the only important thing that that uh, uh, that could have generated the you know the the reform period, and that it's not clear to me after that whether anyone had any real control over what the possibilities were. In the 70s, I met a number of, of scholars who had been. I met two or three sociologists who had been at Charles University who, who um, came over here and tried to teach for a while and decided no matter what they were doing at home, they couldn't 
you know, they would miss it too much. Right? Um, but I'd be really interested in in, in, um, in the, how any of the people who lived this history um, at some point or another would feel about this. But their, what, what the proposition they put to me was, the Soviet Union should have invaded. Incidentally, they were very much against the invasion. From the Soviet point of view, they should have invaded. There is no way that this particular dynamic would have stopped at socialism in the human face. The demands were for more openness than that. And, and, and the Soviet Union was right to be worried about a 2,000 words document that was, that was asking for much more. Okay. Um, so, and, and I mention that because, because although, you know, although the Soviet invasion was the crudest possible violation of sovereignty, and, and it was very much a concern about the self-interest of the bloc, and it really should have been. Okay. I mean, it really was a danger to the whole bloc. Um, and it, you know, it's too bad that they didn't notice that. But um, so, so I mean, the, the starting point is that that a a leadership that didn't have a clear that had a clear sense sense that socialism ought to be able to do better, that a clear hope that it could, that you know that you know you know that startlingly opened up full discussion on this matter in March, um, but. But who actually didn't have a strategic vision? I don't. Just Dubček hoped that the system could be more human, but he didn't have a real strategic vision of how you get there. Um, and um, but did want to be responsive. And and uh, and and because he had been head of the Slovak party, I just want to make sure that because he. <laughs> This is an investment seminar next, next oh, door. I'm not sure what <laughs> caused them to laugh. Um, so so uh, um, I think what was important was that because of the open discussion and because of the fact that this would have to be a series of strategic bargains about what was possible, um, you, di you did see that by the time the Communist Party's action program was formulated and announced in late spring, April, that federalization was going to be part of it. Okay. And that federalization was something that, as long as it wasn't terribly authentic, would, would not be upsetting to the Soviet Union. After all, it was possible to say the Soviet model of dealing with national identity is to have a federal state. And you know, we can remain we can tell an ideological story about this um, that you know that won't frighten the Soviet Union any more than we know they were already frightened. Because we do know we know much more about what was going on inside Czechoslovakia in 1968 because people were able to talk. We know we know we knew less until afterwards about what was going on in Moscow. But we know that Operation Danube, which would eventually resort, result in the, um, in, the, in the invasion in August, was already being um, strategically like, contingency planned and developed, even at this time. So, In one respect, the action program of the Communist Party was a kind of, 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 of dike against the larger questions that could have emerged. And, uh, and you know, I think Czechs and Slovaks were pretty well aware that you know that they were walking a tightrope. But what the you know, what, the, what was hoped, and the, and the hope that was lost after 1968, 
was that as long as you did not do what the Hungarians did and say you were going to become neutral, that, that it might be possible to pull this off. It might be possible to make some serious changes um, within society. Um, after 68, it became clear that was one of the messages that that you know that that just staying in the Warsaw Treaty Organization and not criticizing the Soviet Union directly was far from sufficient to allow you to conduct your own affairs. In any case, once it became necessary to 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 uh, uh, try to develop the components of the action plan. Over the summer, you, you began to see debates that uh, were um, prominent both within Slovakia and between the two capitals, um, in which the pr previous accords, those previous agreements, begin to sit on the table. And, and uh, there, there begins to be the kind of tension um, and the reminders of this is why this is necessary, and and then the um, the mantra of ingratitude that you started to see in the Czech press. Okay, we built you up, you know, we we build up you up economically. We're doing every from you, thing from you, and ingratitude was a word that I was just learning. Czech and Slovak at that time was one of the early words I learned uh, because there was uh, there there was so much argument about who uh, about what what the rights ought to be and what the historical you know context in which federation ought to be guaranteed and less so about exactly what it would constitute um, that is. Um, the, the technical constitutional uh, um, you know, programs that were being developed, it's not as if they were being carefully evaluated. It was a much broader uh, and tenser con conversation. But the coalition that had, had ousted Novotny was both Czech and, and Slovak, and, and the key political decisions made after that were, I think, as well. But the consequences of that period are the things that I think are important because just as I find it hard to imagine the 1968 without the Slovak identity and dimension to the coalition, um, I think that not, what happened as a result of the federalization of the state made independence more or less inevitable, both institutionally and attitude. And, and so that's the, you know, the last thing I want to make sure I want to <coughs> cover. Um, attitudinally, I think that, that the Czechs emerged from the invasion and from the normalization. And this is something I shouldn't say I think. I think there's a generally accepted, um, um, with the complaint that they lost everything, the Czechs had lost everything, but the Slovaks had had gotten federalist, a federal state, and that um, you know, and that normalization, and and then they and then the Czechs and Slo had gotten Husak as. And almost immediately, they seem to have forgotten that Dubček was so important to the, you know, to the opening, and but rather focus on on a you know a political figure who you know, had credentials that Moscow must have thought would look good, like having been been imprisoned and and uh, um, you know you know, a, you know, a, you know a communist from the interwar period and so forth. Um, but you know, but it, it's very clear that almost immediately the perception in the Czech lands uh, was that um, that they that they had that they had lost the things they hoped to gain, but that but the Slovaks had federalism, and there wasn't any 
really good sense that the Czechs might benefit from federalism. Um, um, and the Czechs and Slovaks, in looking at the federal system, um, saw different things. Okay. Um, the Czechs had to put together a Czech National Council because there hadn't been one. Um, the, its utility, I think, wasn't clear to them. Um, the, the, what, what they didn't see is that, and what a lot of Slovaks had seen beforehand and certainly could also confirm afterwards, is that is it, uh, a federal system that isn't democratic is the Soviet Union's federal system. It's not terribly useful. Um, as an institutional base, it's particularly not useful if the party isn't federalized. It was supposed to be, but you went on in a situation where the, basically the Czechs had the Czechoslovak Communist Party, and the Slovaks had the Slovak Communist Party, and so the countrywide Communist Party was what remained remained um, the, the basis for where Czech decision making occurred. And I think it was expected that the party would be federalized. And I think the combination of the loss of democratization, I mean, the, the loss of the chance of opening that system and the closing of it, uh, the failure for the place where the action is, the Communist Party, to follow suit. And then, and then thirdly, um, the retraction of even some of the competences. But, you know, by 1970, the, the, um, you know, the uh, federal bargain had been shrunk so that the individual councils had very little power compared to what had been possible and certainly what had been formally granted in the terms of economics. And um, the most surprising thing I read in the party press during the first normalization crackdown is it was an article uh, which 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 I mentioned in, in my first book uh, that, that said you know we should have learned from Abraham Lincoln Lincoln knew you know in the 19th century that you had to have a unified economy and a unified country and that you know, which the connection of this with Czechoslovak Communist Party politics was very odd, except that they wanted to make the case that the union ought to be preserved in some way. Lincoln probably turned over in his grave. This was a you know a very cynical point. Um, so so uh, what seemed to Czechs to be a special deal that came out of the reform period. Um, to the Slovaks, I think, pretty soon became clear, was, was not a particularly useful deal. That, that, you know, that, the, you know, that, that the gains from that, while they weren't negligible, were not a matter of, of, of developing power within the system. And what's more, I think that um, the message, not only did the Czechs feel that, the, that federalism was a gain only for, for Slovaks and not for them, um, but I think they weren't reading their own public opinion polls. Because although there were arguments, very serious ones, in Slovakia about whether federalism should be pushed as a first priority. If you look at the public opinion polls, and those two were genuine in '68, were genuine opinion polls where people expressed um, opinions. What, what's very striking about them is that the difference on all the issues of reforming society, um, you know, that were asked, the action program, or you know, or censorship, or the removal of censorship, the Czechs and Slovaks really were. Uh, never more than about 10 percentage points apart. There was never a big gap, except on one issue. <laughs> and that issue was the 
reworking of the relationships between Czechs and Slovaks. On that, there was for you know general and the question asked was 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 set up as an opinion question to invite a yes, this is a good thing. They didn't ask contentious questions about federalization, but they said shouldn't the Czech, the public opinion question was shouldn't Czechs and Slovaks um, you know, regulate their relationship? It didn't say how. And yet only only a little over 50% of Czechs said that's a good idea, a very good idea. And then another group said said that's okay. But it was clear uh, it was clear that on the you know, on on most issues there wasn't much difference, but on this issue there was a, a a tremendous disinterest and lot of intensity on the Czech side um, that that created you know a, a public you know, opinion gap, and that was practically the only gap. Everybody wanted an open society and, and more democracy and um, and. The support for open discussion in the media was very strong. Okay. Um, you know, after the after the you know, the moat was closed again, after you know about 1970, we're no longer in this wonderful position of being able to read the press and read the you know and read the, the and get public opinion polling that tells us what people are thinking. Um, but. talk about consequences now. During normalization, the, you know, the underground discussions continued. The, you know, the some of the of the of the dissident journals based in the West continued to discuss these issues. Um, we didn't have nearly as much to go on, but it was clear that the ingratitude um, versus you don't understand kind of dialogue was continued. Um, but I think that uh, you, know, ab you know, above all, um, nothing could have, you know, nothing could have developed out of this except as it had in the past, the, the, those critical junctures where the issues could be raised together. Okay. And, um, and so in 1989, they precisely were. But in 1999, there's a tremendous difference from any time in the past, which is that that largely powerless federal system suddenly became significant precisely as Anyone, you know, as many people were arguing back in 1968, if this system is democratized, it matters. If it's not, it doesn't. Okay. So um, the fact that there were elected bodies that could speak at all levels of the system, the fact that um, the fact that that was the legacy of 1968, okay, that there were that there were places where negotiated, ne negotiations could occur, that, um, and, and that there were, what's more, I mean, if, if everybody in, in Czechoslovakia in 1989 had felt that that issue was passé, then it wouldn't have emerged in this way. But we could tell that it, it did, um, and that there were two party systems in the new Czechoslovakia, one in each, one in each national council. And so, so you also had the opportunity to, it's possible that there could have been statewide parties. Possible, but, but because these issues were still relevant, um, that was not in fact what happened. So, but so for the you know for you know so in the first instance, if if federation had not occurred in 19, um, 1968, I just ask you to think about 
what national politics would have been like because um, there would not have been a way of, or a necessity of adjudicating this issue at the national level. Um, the, um, and the whole constitutional process that produced federation in 1968 was very conscious of just that. They talked about the need to devise a system that would not be subject to majoritization. Um, and and that, that there would be structures in the system that would mean that basic rights could be protected and not simply outvoted. And that was part of what it made it absolutely essential in 1989 to deal with this issue. Um, the other thing I wanted to be sure to draw your attention to uh, in, in that context um, which is the last part of, 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 of thinking about institutions matter. If you look at, if you look at the public opinion poem, this poll is more, is, this set of polls, which, which I pulled from some different places, um, is actually more important in explaining why federation was important and why it couldn't last than just knowing that most Czechs and most Slovaks favored a continuation of the state, which is absolutely true in, in, in the negotiations of, of, the, of the early post-communist period. Um, but it's these polls that I think help tell you that the problem was that the, in, in that or probably in almost any period, that the common state that everyone was in favor of wasn't the same common state. That the common state that, that Slovaks were, were thinking about um, were shifted toward the, you know, shifted toward the federal or confederal, and the common state that the Czechs most favored were tilted toward um, the unitary and the federal and away from the confederal. Okay. So even if you don't have a strong movement for independence to begin with, it's easy to see where that deadlock came from. I mean, because um, it wasn't just the politicians, although it certainly was the politicians, who um, found it useful to talk about a common state but not be willing to bargain. But the problem was once they came to try to bargain, what would have been <coughs> effective for, for Slovak logic and what would have been effective for Czech opinion were quite different. Um, but if, if you look at the countries that have you know, minority populations that have, have been blocked elsewhere in the block, it's only where you have a federation that you're able to get to independence. The other, you know, the other unitary states, despite a number of them having large minorities, um, are not independent states now. Okay. And, and, and so I think that that's probably the most significant thing that 68 did. It gave a largely toothless federation a, a uh, um, kind of a time bomb quality. You know, that, that, that eventually, when that system was actually activated, it would um, make a genuine difference. Um, just one, one last question, the issue of historical memory. Um, the historical memory in the West has never been very good. Um, you know, if you look at the first page, and you've all seen this, and you're Washingtonians, you've probably seen it in your own papers. Here are the three key Slovak figures of, of, the, of, the 19, of 1968. Okay. And 
all of them have, you know, none of them still survive. And all of them died in the United States as Czechs. I'm sure you know noticed that. Now I agree that you know, I agree that in some cases, if you read the obituaries or whatever, you will find that somewhere in there they'll be called Czechoslovak, or they may even be called Slovak. But it seems that the headline, um, you know, they're, they're not sure what to do with it, and they could at least give space to make it Czechoslovak. Um, but but uh, yeah, but but for the American press, all of these people have always been Czech, and and. Uh, and uh, for the historical memory um, within, you know, for, for the recognition that there is such a thing as a Slovak, that may be one good reason to have your own state, because you're never going to get it this way. Um, but more largely, um, you know, I, I, when I was thinking about this, I asked, do, do, do what are the commemorative events? How do people think about 68? How do they commemorate it? How is it commemorated now? Um, and I've never been in Slovakia, Slovakia in August, so I, you know, you know, don't know. I do know that they are commemorated. I do know that, uh, unfortunately, this turned out darker, darker than I hoped. But if you look at that, the, the picture of the man in front of the tank, how many of you know that picture? Anyone? A few of you. Um, this is something I couldn't find, but this is something everybody thinks that's Prague, but it isn't. It's Bratislava, and and uh, it is, you know, it, it is frequently in the press now, um, and it has a it has a um, you know you know a, a, a real echo um, internationally because um, you know a generation. Later, you were going to have the tank man in, in Tiananmen Square, and um, you know, an exceptionally brave act. Although this, uh, although in this picture it was an intentional act, and in Tiananmen Square, if you've ever looked at tank man, he seems to have been doing his shopping and just suddenly decided to stop. And the three students who died in Bratislava are commemorated every year. Um, but the most, the biggest recent controversy, and it's a controversy that, you know, the historical memory of, of past events is filtered through, um, you know, you know, the politics and. Um, um, Kevin Deegan, Krauss, and I, and Sharon Walchick, and is she speaking to you at all this year? Who are all people interested in both the Czechs and the Slovaks? Um, did a paper on the commemorations in Slovakia of 1989. Um, and you find that, and you found then the same thing. It's not so much that certain past events are more or less. Um, um, Disputed as that they are prioritized. So, uh, Fizzo always wants to talk about the Slovak National Uprising because that's and and, um, and where, whereas the you know commemorating 1989 was not too interesting. To me. Um, you know, 1968 is not that contentious, but it's also increasingly less resonant. But what is resonant is is the invasion itself um, and and the fact that um, you know that that it was also a political coalition and not not any particular group that invited the invasion to begin with and of course the invitation was made long after the planning um, so so the the fact that there was an invitation letter that um, that was po published in the in the press after, and presumably also, you know, all over this, the block, after, um, after the invasion, that was the plea from the leaders uh, to, uh, you know, Czechoslovakia to come in. That was a coalition document, too. That was the losing, you know, the side that felt it was losing ground 
significantly because the new party congresses were coming up and it was likely that they would be stripped of the hardliners. And from the point of view uh, uh, of the five signatories, one was for Indra, was born in Slovakia, but basically made his career he, in Moravia and then in the central government. He was uh, not, you know, the, the, the one who made his career in the Slovak Communist Party was Vasil Bila. And he was the only one still alive when the letter was dug up in the Soviet archives and President Yeltsin turned it over to President Kava. And for the first time, first of all, it, it killed all the old arguments that this letter had not been signed by anyone in the country. By that time, almost no one believed that the Soviets merely made it up. Although we now have in, in Brezhnev's handwriting, where, he, where they gave him the letter and then he edited it to add a few uh, details. And in, so we, so the, because we have the Yeltsin gift of the archival letter, we can see the editing that Brezhnev did. He wanted to make it clear that military force might be necessary to come in. And that wasn't perhaps as clear, clear enough to him in the way they had drafted this, perhaps too carefully. Um, but it was also clear who had signed it. And although that was a coalition of three Czechs, one Slovak who made his career in, in, um, in, in the Czech section, and, and Bilak was the one who was still alive. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that two of the senatories died in 1990, because I think the stress of knowing that the you know, that the day of reckoning would come was probably very great. In one case, um, in one case, uh, you know, one of the two died, committed suicide. Um, so, um, and, and um, earlier, so, the, and, and the earlier deaths meant that only, only Vasil uh, Vila was still alive. Um, so he would be the figure who represented 1968, the figure who represented the hardliners, um, the figure who had um, betrayed the country. And so that became the question of how do we deal with this? Um, and the focus of historical memory on that invasion was on him um, and what he could be tried for after that length of time. and. Um, and, and they should probably know that trial dragged on until 2011 when it was decided that it was really too late to pull together a case. You know, that's straggling. So this will be left to the National Memory Institutes, um, from which we have heard recently, because after he did die in, in February of 2014, how many of you know about, what, about the controversy? Anyone? Um, his hometown in eastern Slovakia, um, the local communist party got up a, a movement to build. What was the name of the town, please? Um, oh dear, Krasna. It may be Krasna Yavna. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. I can, I can, I can tell you later. In the district of Pressure. Hmm? In the district of Pressure. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, but but actually, yeah, I I can I can look it up for you afterwards. Um, yeah, it was it was um, you know so so the, you know it was this town at the instigation apparently of the local communist party. We're talking about the communist party, the extra parliamentary largely. I mean, they do show up for um, you know public events, but they don't have you know a, a real political base. And, and, and they really haven't had for a long time. They were briefly represented in Parliament. Um, they are very ancient, but they are the curators of, of the historical memory of 68 and other periods to defend them. They are the ones that uh, commemorate 1989 with a coffin for the death of socialism, right? So, um, so here they want to make a hero of, of of the of, of the the, the uh, signatory of the letter of invitation to invasion, okay. and this you know caused controversy. The 
you know, the monument went up. The slogan at the bottom of the monument was, truth remains truth. <laughs> and, ouch. Ouch, yes. Um, and um, a group of dissident artists then went and splashed red paint over the monument. Um, they were arrested by the local police and then released. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I th what, what I found interesting about it is, first of all, there was a storm of, of media condemnation that the town would have done this, okay? that, that this person would have been honored. Um, and, and pressure on, even though the monument had clearly been defiled, you can see one of, I, yeah, I should have lightened the toner on the, uh, when I made this Xerox, I didn't realize what happened. But you can see the, the gentleman who has just defaced the, the, the memorial and is standing in front of it having his picture taken. He's taking responsibility for this. He probably knows it will not ruin his life. Uh, but but, but uh, I think it's important that, that um, you know, that what people remem seem to be commemorating in Slovakia today, about 1968, is the invasion. And, and the invasion which was not what was resented and, and, and the cause of anger and despair all the way across the, the whole country. Um, and and um, you know one of the things that uh, Basubila complains about in his memoir that he published in the nineties is that when he came back, um, you know people you know he had trouble getting from the airport. You know, um, he you know people you know yelled at him on the street. Finally, he was very grateful to a neighbor. A neighbor's son who came over and said, look, I'm afraid no one will serve you in the stores. You want me to go get you some food? I mean, um, it, was, it, was very, it was very clear that, the, you know, that whatever happened in 68, um, that, that the source of commemoration was about the outrage of the international intervention. Okay? And um, because the, you know, a new constitution in a new country supplanted it, um, you know, the, the importance of that federal institutional document that gave the Slovaks a position in, in, in 1989 to say, we have to agree to this bargain. There's a, you know, there's a house of, you know, there's a house of representatives, a house of nations, you know, the house of the people, and we all have to agree on this, and, and that means that our leaders have to agree on it. And, and sure enough, the leaders with the, whose parties had the greatest clout decided that they would be prime ministers of their of their respective republics and not of the national government. Um, when, when the final thing came, that you know, it, it's interesting that that I guess there isn't a focus or a way of of, of commemorating that part of the Prague Spring, and the fact that we call it the Prague Spring probably says something to that effect. But you know, I think that you know, I think that even though it doesn't become a subject of historical memory, it is um, it is the most important part of the Prague Spring. Even though at the time um, the Czechs thought it was a buyout, a sellout, and the Slovaks were disappointed that it changed the power structure not at all. So those are the main things I want to say. I'd really like to hear, not questions, but comments. I think um, I'm not a professional historian, but I'm buff of history. You know, in this whole history of Czechoslovakia, if you look to it from the very beginning, let's say from the Pittsburgh Agreement or the Cleveland Agreement, then the Czechs and Slovaks agreed with each other because they got politicized. They, they learned about democracy and the politics. 
and they agreed that they should have a state one-to-one -one in Pittsburgh agreement, or at least autonomy or whatever. But when Thomas Masaryk came to Pittsburgh for that, and he had seen the agreement, then he threw it to the wastebasket. And he asked for a piece of sheet of paper, and then he made up his Pittsburgh agreement, you know, which then went into history of the Czechoslovakia, the piece of Pittsburgh agreement. But my point is not that, really. The point is that basically, the conception or the establishment of Czechoslovakia or the connection of the two people had from the very beginning a genetic defect. A, a genetic defect. So this was not, never was that a community of two identities, one to one. Prague had always the upper hand from 1918 to 1918. And that was a fundamental problem, you know. It smoldered always, you know, in the background. And, and in various variation, uh, during the democratic period of Czechoslovakia, the first 20 years, and then, you know, the, then were the war years. And then in 48, when Czechoslovakia was taken over by Communist Party, it's supposed to be international, but was basically a Czech party, which again dominated the whole Czechoslovakia. You know, so it, it was never really, uh, it, there were tremendous differences between the Bohemian Kingdom, so to, so to speak, and the northern part of Hungary or Slovakia, you know. That's, that's a different point. These citizens in Europe were different as American citizens. They didn't understand the equality of political equality. You know, in Slovakia, these were rural people. In Czech, uh, in, in Czech Republic, there was the industry which was built, built, built up by Austrians, you know. And so, so the tremendous, and if there would be a better handling of the Slovaks, you know, from the very beginning, then this smoldering discrepancy, you know, would not last from 1918 to 19. And Czechoslovakia would remain in, uh, uh, like for instance in Switzerland, you have cantons, you know, and they are one to one, you know. But that was never the case here. It was never, the, and you know, I, I didn't read your book years ago, you know, but you were one of the few who handled the Czech and Slovak question in an equality, you know, in, in more understanding. Mm -hmm. And the newer book, you know, Mary Hyman's Czechoslovakia, the states which mm -hmm. failed, and I, you know, I'm sure you have it. So that was the problem that the more intelligent Czechs didn't understand that these Janosiks, you know, the less <laughs> <of them. laughs> They want to have their identity too, you know. And if, you know, like, for instance, the constitution of the first parliament so in, in Prague, you know, it was a farce. You know, the Slovaks were, were rudely played out from the from the composition of the party. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, certainly. And this was, This is just a little example, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it certainly is is true, and, and that that on uh, that. <coughs> and I have nothing against Czech, you know. I'm just looking at it, you know, that it just just didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, originally, oh, no. Czechoslovakia was supposed to be like Switzerland. They come to yeah, they, they did talk about it that way. Excuse but on the other hand, yeah, I mean, yes, it, it wasn't, it, it, you know, there, there were some essential flaws both in the attitudes and in the structuring of that relationship. But it's also true that that it was a solution to a problem. That it was. That, you know, but that existed for all these countries. And, you know, the whole thing wasn't terribly well thought out. 
Um, but I, I mean, the whole project of reconstructing Eastern Europe wasn't terribly well thought out. Um, but so, but but I mean, there was a reason why you would think, well, Czechs are the Hungarians. I mean, that doesn't. You know, what did what did Czechs? Well, why Hungary? the Slovaks might. In thinking about what the alternative political futures oh, would oh, be for oh, them you mean in, that in the wake of the war. Yeah, I right understand right. your point, but that's not my point. No, I do under I do understand, but still, I think that that there was some crisis decision making going on here. That you know that um, where where some of the consequences paid, played out. Don't but I mean the Pittsburgh. Agreement is actually a very good example because when it became clear this was going to look like a unitary state, and Lincoln went off to the Paris Peace Conference, that was immediately understood as being a traitor, right? And, but what was it? What was being betrayed was the structure of the state, not you know really yeah. that. Yeah. So I mean, it was almost immediately a kind of crisis of um, of attitudes that you're off. Uh, always deserting us in a crisis. Anyway, I'm sorry. The, the other comments? Uh, just uh, the the Hot Spring basically started when Dubček was uh, took over the, uh, the government, and it lasted until the invasion. What was the perception in the surrounding countries? Because I would think, with the long border with Poland. There would have been some contacts. There would have been uh, um, the opportunity for that to spill over, and and I have not heard about a Prague Spring necessarily in Poland or Hungary. Well, well let me tell matter. you what was going on in Poland in 1960. I mean, 1968 was a European phenomenon. In Poland in 1968. There was a, 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 a university and student movement. Yeah. Um, there was a good deal of unrest, and 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 the neighbors were all very much afraid that that the the, the reform example was going to contaminate their country. It was almost immediately in the spring that the East German leaders and the Polish leaders went to Moscow, said to Moscow, "You got to do something about this. This is." Mm -hmm. Yeah. And pretty soon, the Soviet Union was worried about Ukraine. In other words, everything that bordered on this, you know, in Czechoslovakia, um, all the people that had to worry about that contamination were indeed worried. And that, you know, the, the Hungarians, the Hungarian government, which had, had was trying trying to maintain a modus vivendi, where they're extremely. Um, surly and unhappy population, and the idea was um, that you, they didn't want anything to stir up. On the other hand, they didn't want to go too far until finally in the summer of, of 1968, when, when the discussion became more and more about, do we really need socialist, socialism anyway, as that became a subtext. Um, but yes, all the surrounding countries were quite anxious to participate in the invasion. Because because they feared just what effect it would have, okay. um, even though the context uh, each of those countries faced a slightly different context, they're all worried about. It. And were there reactions in these countries in the population? Um, well, well, I, as I say, the Poles probably wouldn't have thought what was going on in Czechoslovakia was any more important than what they were doing. I mean, because they were really having a crisis too. It was partially. I mean, there was there was a a. Uh, 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 an anti-Semitic anti mobilization within the Communist Party. There were the student movements. They were having their own troubles, and this was, you know, every few years the Poles had to re replace their leaders because of some kind of, of you know, of, of, of upheaval. So I think that, uh, but as for Germany, it was just simply, you know, a country that was keeping the lid on not all that long from when they had to close the border. I mean, they, you know, they were just getting things settled down. Um, so I don't think it had, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think it had a, a, a big effect at the, I, I mean, people would have been somewhat aware of it, but the, the main effect was to make the neighbors um, um, 
enthusiastic about invading. Yeah, it's Mark Kramer with the Cold War Project. Yes, right. Has has done some very good work with this, and so look look up his work because it's it's really right. exceptional. Yeah. I don't know if everybody the Journal of Cold War Studies, is, which is the Kramer operation, and 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 uh, actually I'm reading I'm on the board for that too. Um, but I, yeah, and I'm reading an article about it's 48 now. Yeah. But yeah, the Cold War History Project um, and the journal, which publishes the work that is published in the journal, it, the idea is it has to be based on archival material that we didn't know during the Cold War. Um, but yes, there 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 are some big. But the, but if I know on my uh, office computer, I can actually open the articles in the Journal of Cold War Studies. But it does. Mark Kramer has a whole bunch of stuff about 68 and the other states. Um, um, I can, if anyone's interested, I can, Helen, I can email you what year that was. But um, so there's some pretty detailed understanding now. But even at the time, it was pretty clear that the leadership was upset. Is there any way that Dubček could have brought it off? I don't personally no. think so. What do you think? No. If he had said, okay, we're, we're going to talk about goulash or whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Knedlicky. Uh, uh, he should have said goulash. That would have been a good thing. <laughs> well, well, like. but, but what if he had focused on sort of what Otto Sheik was pushing uh, and not talked about liberalizing, the, unleashing the media? I mean, in the embassy, we were reading stuff like uh, Cat and Forest Massacre headlines. We thought, my God, the Russians are never going to put up with this. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so well, what if he had really, uh, he didn't uh, He didn't have a majority in the Central Committee, so that really limited what he could do. He seemed to be calling in public support in various ways. Is there any way at all that he could have gotten away with a, a more limited kind of thing? Um. Yeah, yes, probably, but yeah. So that is yeah. That is the big historical conundrum. There's a the point of no return is March. The minute you start allowing, I mean, which you've already suggested, right? I mean, as soon as you start allowing, basically abolishing censorship. I'm just not not just loosening, not just glossinist, but actual actual um, permission. I mean, eventually. The Gorbachev era came to that point, but the minute he started doing it, it was too late. Um, but but you're right; he didn't have a reformist majority and would not it, until the 14th Party Congress, which never took place in the what well, was took place in secret and then was disavowed. And so when it finally happened, it was after it was too late. Um, so I think I. I, I think it's possible that he could have pulled that off. Um, I, I mean, it wouldn't have, but I'm not sure that it would have meant that, that he could have then pulled off a genuine economic reform that would have made the economy function better. And I mean, and eventually the goulash came um, in, in the sense that, uh, at least in the Czech Republic, um, the, the number of people who had dachas who had their little weekend cottages um, was staggering. I mean, it, 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 there was no other place in the block where that was encouraged as much. Okay, just get out of town on weekends. Don't sit around making trouble. Um, so, so could he have staggered along in a sort of Brezhnev style? I suppose so. I, I because I don't because if he could have done something for. From, you know, begun to to uh, give Slo Slovakia a better chance um, to to feel that they had their voices heard at the national level. Um, you know, the the coalition that that pushed out Novoselic had no idea what was going to happen yet. So I think it's a very interesting counterfactual, but I. I and, and I actually don't know if I thought about it for a few weeks, if I would agree with what I just said. Um, but I think we both agree that there was a point of no return, and that before that, you might have been able to do something that would have kept, 
kept the system going along in its gray manner, maybe a somewhat improvement. But I'm not sure that they could have pulled off the economic reform without the full open discussion that might have been necessary. Because there are a lot of vested interests that didn't want it. Right. Yeah, just to double up on that. Uh, there was this term that really came out in the 68 and after period, socialism with a human face. And so they were really trying to reform socialism. In fact, I think that's what Gorbachev was really trying to do. But attitudinally in the population, do you have a sense of whether people were really accepting of socialism, but they just wanted to be able to read the paper things and feel freer or something like that? Or were they, because there's this whole issue of, were they really accepting of a Western-style capitalist economy? You know? yeah. Okay, and I think even to today, that's a, that's a yeah. problem. But, you know, yeah. And so they really wanted to build socialism, and, you know, I don't know yeah, if that, a, was that possible. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is an interesting thing, because after all, um, although this wasn't true of Slovakia, in the interwar period, I was just about to say how strong the left was in interwar Czech area, um, and and how popular the idea after World War II was of nationalizing some of the industry. That wasn't that 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 was a card the communists could play at that point. Okay, um, and 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 by you know certainly by 1989. Um, even with how badly socialism had performed economically compared to what they might have hoped. And, and people found that deeply embarrassing. And a Communist Party leader in the 80s even said, in, um, um, actually it may have been uh, the, the Prime Minister Strobel, um, we are a museum of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> so it's not that they were proud of the economy, but if you, but when the polls could be given, people were very enthusiastic about democracy and being able to vote for, you know, for their leaders, and a little doubtful about what would happen when the economy was open. I mean, they were, you know, definitely very much, um, you know, concerned about what the consequences of that would be. And it is true that in the early stages of capitalism, and I'm talking about. 19th century capitalism, Chinese capitalism, the first thing that happens is things get very unequal. And then, you know, then once you get your safety net, you know, the Western Europe begins to become more balanced. But that is the first thing that's going to happen. And, and there is going to be unemployment. And there was unemployment in Yugoslavia in 68. Some of the economists talked about this. We're going to have to tolerate that. Because unemployment, right now we've got hidden unemployment. With people doing somewhat empty jobs and not con contributing to the productivity. But um, yeah, so yeah, it, it would be. It, it, it's a question how, how you could have built that reform coalition. Um, that would have substituted. Yeah. Can I just say something you have to check? You know, he was he was a product of Soviet Union. He grew up there. He studied there. And they trusted him. And he, he was at home at Brezhnev. He slept on the sofa. You know, so Brezhnev couldn't imagine that he would do this to him. And you know, well, whatever. <laughs> and the, the slogan, the socialism is human face, that was not Duchek's idea. That was taken by a Czech writer, you know. And personally, I think he, he was not really a leader. He was a soft guy. He was a very good man you know, family man and everything. And he virtually grew up, his father was a communist, you know, who went to Interhelpo to, to Russia to build up Gruzini or whatever. So, and he was very quickly outplayed in Moscow when they were, after the 68, the consultation by Gustav Gusta, you know. So he was, he was in a very soft uh, position. So 
he was not real. I think he was a very nice man, a very good man, but he therefore Husak, you know, <laughs> could take it over. <laughs> he was a leader. Yeah, I am I've been trying to 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 follow the discussions about how we should think about uh, about Husak as a political figure. And there are those, for example, who feel that he was he had he had miscalculated. I mean, his place in history, he could be, have been in little doubt by the time he died that his place in history was not at all what he would have wanted. It's, um, and he felt increasingly isolated and lonely. And a lot of people said, would say, well, too bad. But, I mean, you're responsible for normalization, and that is why you're isolated. Um, but there's some people who say he had rather thought that, that the situation had had you know the, the the Soviet invasion had been based on an expectation that they'd be also able to replace a, a loyal regime and the, the public response had not been it was a military success and a public relations disaster and he thought he had some latitude so um, you know some people argue that he miscalculated he thought Husak by this that if I take over there and I settle things down I'm going to have some leeway to get something, you know, to get something, <coughs> salvage something more out of this. And that's the sort of lenient view of him. Okay? And that he discovered that that wasn't true. Um, he didn't, and, and, you know, and, and at a certain point by the mid-70s, he just decided to hold on to power. And there are people who feel that he made that deal with the devil from the beginning, and that, um, that you know, he could see that he had some bargaining chips, like I have the distinction of being a dissident, uh, not a dissident, being a, a victim of yeah, purges, not a dissident, <laughs> the distinction yeah. of serving in jail. Um, I have the distinction of, of, you know, of having a legitimate political following at that point, um, and some respect. And he, you know, he so, and he that I will parlay that into running the show. I mean, so there's a, a fairly broad spectrum, and you know, I guess you know, I, I guess one of the things that's pretty striking is that um, although there have been books written now, this is you know the societies have moved on, so we may never know as much as I would sort of like to know about these figures of '68. Even the reformers of '68, being a '68er. In 1989, being a 68er was already, that was not a compliment. You know, that was, you know, we've moved on and, and, and you belong to that era that didn't take us for a while ago. So, so I, yeah. I would like to approach something a little bit further back. But in processing some paperwork of my father, I found out that at one point he was listed as President for Slovakia, President pro Slovensko. He was a Slovak. And of course, it was a period which I knew about, but I was a child, you know, so it didn't really resonate. But I asked Nemechek, who was editing my father's books in the history of the Academy of Sciences, historical institute. I said, what is this? Because there is a check and there's a salary statement from President Masaryk. Oh, uh, there's a check, C-H-E-C-K? Or, uh, I'm sorry. Check, no, uh, cash. Yes, right. Oh, okay, got it, right. <laughs> <laughs> In this room, it can be confusing. <laughs> Vice President for Slovakia. And I said, I never heard. My father never said anything about that. You know, it's just... Something. In what, and what period was this? In 1936 7, that period when he left, he had been minister in the cabinet for Interior. Mm -hmm. And then in, 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 in 35, he was named minister to Poland. Mm -hmm. And in the changes of thing, I found that this, this order signed by Masaryk. You know, this is the authorization for the 
administrative stuff. And I said, so I, I said to, to Nemechek, I said, what is this? He said, I don't know. <laughs> and the thing was that it was not stated vice president of Slovakia, but for Slovakia. Mm. This is not a problem. Yeah. So vice see, president of what? Yeah, well, then, uh, so Ben Nemechek yeah. did find out eventually there was when a high-ranking member of the government was on sort of leave of absence, that he would be made, if he was a Slovak, he'd be made vice president for Slovakia. <laughs> and, and then, of course, when he went to his post, he became ambassador first here. Yeah. You know, but in so, the meantime, he had to have some sort of title. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and so it really it was, but my father had a lot of help, you know, in the locally. He, did, he was very much beloved because he, he built them a rail, railroad to Nemecka Lucha and stuff like that. But it was for agricultural things. <laughs> you sort of wonder, you know, because basically the Slovaks were perfect in the foreign affairs. I mean, because they had practically most of the foreign affairs political slots, not Czechs. But, just an anecdote soon. My wife and myself, we are emigres of 1968. Mm -hmm. So I have to be thankful <laughs> <laughs> that I am here. And we departed from Bratislava just two minutes. On July 1st, with our two small children, two and five, in a small Renault car, and we crossed from Bratislava to Hungary. And this was in? 1940, 1968, June summer. 1. Okay, summer. So like six weeks before England. Yeah, right. And <clears throat> we are crossing the border, you know, come to the first little town. We go out and suddenly we look at the fields and we have seen tanks, Hungarian tanks, July 1st. And they oh. were aiming with the turrets to Slovakia. Yeah, I was so exercise. nervous <laughs> <laughs> I had to stop yeah, right. to take some death. And then we went to vacation. And we arrived from Adriatic to Belgrade on <coughs> August 19th. And had a day of rest with our friends. And in the morning, of August 21, we wanted to go home. <laughs> and suddenly we wake up, the sirens are blowing and everything, and a total chaos in Berlin. You know, they were reporting, uh, in Belgrade, I'm sorry. And there was a, you know, invasion of the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact Army. And there were tremendous demonstration. And the point that I want to make, I went with my son and with a friend to the parliament. And in the parliament, they were members of the Czechoslovak government, like the, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Hayek, was there. The Economy Minister, Otašik, was there, you know. And, and they were all waving, <laughs> we were yelling. <laughs> so it was, and the Yugoslavs, there was 50,000 Czechoslovak citizens in Belgrade at that time. And the Yugoslavs were the most grateful host. They take care of everybody. <laughs> Lodging, food, mm -hmm. gas, everything. Mm -hmm. Off the shop. Mm -hmm. really. wow. Those And I don't... Yeah, yeah, yeah but still, I don't it, 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 it is interesting. And and of course, you probably on that day didn't go back, and also didn't know. No, we never did go back. Yeah, Most but, but uh, on that day, you probably didn't know for sure. No, 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 we no, no, no. We stayed there. I was working actually there for three weeks. Yeah. So well, one more comment, because because all that great food is over there, and we only have twenty minutes. To oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and for talking with Carol one on one. Yes, right. I'm, I, I, we have a person here who can give me maybe the answer, but at one point, Bilak was supposed to be invited in Prague to come to the U.S. 
on the cultural exchange grant, mm -hmm. and the embassy has apparently offered the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, had offered this to Vilar apparently at a meeting. I don't, I'm not sure that it was that, but he was. And the thing was that we got the, the cable came through Washington State Department, and it got everybody all mixed up. Andy Valuchek, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, you know a lot of a lot of people who were. Communist food in. Hmm? Communist food come in. No, and we said, you know, this is crazy. You not now. This is they're in trouble, and you don't want to send them over to the U.S. to, to say I've been to the United States. And, yes. <laughs> and so we, we managed to quash that. But was that was that before you were, you were there in Prague? I don't remember Bilak. We we wouldn't have proposed Jim Bilak. Whoever had given the invitation. So this is what, what you, you're talking That's about. That's what I'm trying to identify the timing of this, this thing. It was when they were really <laughs> already in trouble. was a wretch. So what was going on in the 70s? No, no, I wouldn't go on that. But in, in 89, we had a number of younger members of the hierarchy who were trying to convince us they were really at heart performers, like Stefan. Uh, yeah, every, and, and yeah. So, yeah, that that kind of thing was going on. And some of them, I think Stefan actually came to New York at uh, some point. We used to get a lot of Eli, I can't imagine. Slo in Slovaks through the uh, uh, Doug Hammarskjöld Fellowship in the United Nations. And that was also a problem for other countries because sometimes they would nominate somebody who was not recognized by the U.S. like Yemen <laughs> at that time. And so, the others would say, if he's not allowed to come to the U.S., we will not come ourselves. And so yeah. this was all of that commercial fellowship. Yeah. Well, yeah, that so cultural exchange is very tricky. Anyway, please, they're, they're great. They're yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.